Now, so I'm going to do something which I guess doesn't happen at TEDx too much. I'm going to start with an equation. All right? And maybe I'm at the, perhaps one of the few places in the world where this is not such a big deal. You can just start a slide with an equation, right? So here it is. And uh, some of you in the audience, uh, probably front benchers, uh, my professors, they might recognize this as something uh, from an economics textbook. Uh, it, it's the reason, I, I'll t tell you the reason why I bring this up. It's something called the Cobb Douglas production function. I vaguely remember uh, in, in, in 2006, 7, when I was doing the coursework, I sort of learned this in the context of Solo's uh, growth model, right? Again, I won't go into all of that because I'm not very good at it, okay? The, there's a reason I bring this up, and that reason specifically is to give me a framework. What this equation talks about is how is value created. Any new product, any new service, I'm also conjecturing that it might also be value in the form of non-profit, uh, so uh, uh, not exclusively in the business world. It could be value in the social world, the cultural world. This is a sort of rough framework which I'm going to use. But then why is the value of a product? And if you have a set of inputs, so you have labor, you have capital, you have technology enablers, so productivity enhancing things, then you can create value, and that value can be measured. That's what the economists said. And at the macro level, perhaps, you know, there's a lot of theory around this, again, which I'm not the most qualified person to speak of. Uh, the only thing I can do is perhaps poke fun at economists. But again, then again, uh, perhaps being in Calcutta is not the best uh, venue to do that, if, if I'm really honest about it, right? So this is the equation. What I'm going to do is, my, my, my theory, okay, is that there have been like radical changes in the, on the input side, L, K, and A, labor, capital, and technology, which enable schmucks like me to create value occasionally, right? I don't need to be part of a huge organization. I don't need to have a large labor force of scientists working under me. I don't need uh, millions of dollars of uh, capital. And I certainly don't need a huge lab, uh, again, a multi-million dollar lab, or any other any technology enabler to do it. What's happening? And this is, this is again, the delving a little bit deeper into it, right? So I'll give you a little context of where, where I'm coming from. What is value? So I told the story of, uh, of the startup, uh, which me and uh, four other engineer, product designer, and my uh, background friends had started. And uh, it, it's the story of Touch B, which is a technology to uh, diagnose anemia at the point of care, uh, not invasively, that is to say, without, without pricking. And uh, this is the team. You'll notice that although we have uh, decent CVs, we actually don't have much of those big inputs. We don't have capital, apart from, you know, uh, a, a, a few th a few thousand rupees we started with a few, uh, in the lakhs, but it's not in the multi-million dollar range which people will talk of as capital. Certainly, we don't have access to labor in a big way. We don't have 25 years of experience in R&D in a huge uh, medical research company. We don't have all of that. Uh, we also don't, if you look at it, don't have the, the technology part of it, it per se. You know, we have just essentially free things. We have a $400 computer and we have the internet. That's all we have, right? We don't have proprietary tools. We don't have, there's a lot of things we don't have. So I won't even get into that, but that's the team. And the, the story is that, of course, that we saw a need, identified the need, framed it into three concise you know, points to elicit the requirements, that a healthcare worker in a, a primary health center in India or similar kind of settings across the developing world does not have access to a point of care tool that she can use in a, a simple way to diagnose, monitor, and then follow up on cases of iron deficiency anemia very specific need which was identified by the doctors in my team and which we followed up on over the uh, course of three years uh, and built something which presumably has value. So there's uh, no needles, no, uh, it's simple to use, carry my kit, that's what we built. I won't, again, jump into that, this is a whole story. I actually, I want to come back to my equation. So anyway, so this, is, this is the technology, we uh, put it on the finger and in about 30 seconds, it gives up the value of uh, hemoglobin oxygen saturation and uh, heart rate and so forth on a screen. Pretty cool, and uh, it works, uh, for those of you who are still engineers at heart, it, it works on something called uh, photoplethysmography. You might have seen, uh, uh, in fact, all of you have seen a pulse oximeter. Some of you don't realize it. it it's the device on the 
singer which is uh, in every Hollywood or Bollywood movie when the hero heroine is in the hospital, you know, there's a tin it, tin it, tin it, that comes from pulse oximeter. Anyway, that's the core principle, photoplasmography, and we sort of stumbled our way, failed our way to hemoglobin as well. Hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll also have three or four other molecules we can uh, uh, shine our light at. So it's pretty exciting. I'm, I'm very happy with where things are going here. And uh, there's a whole uh, business or commercial side of things which is also going on. How to take it to a market, it's, an, it's a challenge and it's, it's a fun challenge. Back to this equation, right? Uh, how did things start out? I, I'll go one by one. There's a couple of changes, I think, in each, each input which are worth talking about. First is technology, okay? Technology enablers. Number one change, if you notice, you know, the world around you, is duct tape. Okay, so, well, in general, I, I could say something like prototyping technology, but this is Aman, uh, one of the co-founders and product designers. If you notice, some of the early versions which we built were easy to fabricate in our own sort of rented garage slash lab slash headquarters, right? So 99% duct tape by weight. That's the first prototype. It's, it's, it's something which is now possible to do to start uh, doing right in your own garage, and that's what we did. We essentially had a uh, very low budget setup. This is, again, like I said, the $400 computer and uh, some free and open source software with which we could start prototyping. We could create, we could convert our idea into a physical thing, value. And we could do this with practically uh, no investment. We could create the IP around this, we could get it prototyped at a reasonably low cost from vendors, and all of that sitting in a rented out uh, uh, place in the outskirts of Mumbai, 9,000 rupees a month, that's all it took, right? And this, this is, I think, one of the changes which has happened in the prototyping side which makes physical things easier to build, right? That's, that's the number one thing. The number two thing, of course, is th think of the plethora of tools you have to communicate and collaborate with everybody else. It's one of those things we all know about, but I can only tell you what I, we have experienced in a very micro way, of what Mohammed Yunus calls the worm's eye view. That's what we have. From a very worm's eye view kind of perspective, what we know is that sitting in our office in Thane, I can actually contact a supplier in China, I can contact a specific fabricator in Germany, I can actually order a component from Japan. All of it comes together in three weeks in our facility in Thane, and without even traveling a single mile, I can actually make stuff. Right? And with, this is fantastic for me. I, I can't imagine, think of the world in 1950, our grandparents' generation, or in 1970 or 80, our parents' generation. Right? They, even the richest person in that, those times did not have access to this magic on the technology side. And it's fantastic. I mean, this is a huge thing. It's a big deal. Second point, labor. Right? And again, the labor word is a bit old-fashioned, but fundamentally what I mean here is people, team, really peop the, the folks who can come together with you and uh, be part of your journey. Uh, the first thing which I want to point out here is an interesting statistic. Many of you will have heard of it. It's that there are more scientists alive today than have ever existed before today. This is staggering. Think about it. This is the stuff exponential kind of uh, uh, equations are made of. That's this huge mass of very talented people today, right there. And most of them, because they have now achieved uh, a lot in their lives, they want to do something they want. They want to intend. They want to really make a difference in their own lives and in others. This is a powerful force I'm talking about. Y is equal to A, L, and K. Oh, by the way, alpha and beta are uh, just two uh, just random coefficients. You can just uh, ignore them unless you're an economist trying to prove something. Then you can just put in whatever value you want. Right? Anyway, so, <laughs> sorry, I promise not to make fun of economists. So it brings me to the main point, right? If you, if you look at that, all of those three inputs are available right there. Right the moment you walk out of this room, or in fact right here on your mobile phones, you have access to each of these inputs. Right? What's stopping you? Why, why isn't why just zooming up? Why are you not producing stuff? That's the question which brings me to intent. That's the only thing missing. Underlining this equation is intent. If you intend to do something, there is nothing stopping you. I, can't I, I can actually repeat this 50 times. If you intend to do something, there is nothing stopping you. Right? That's, wow, I mean, look at it. Intent, you have intent. 
you have everything. In my mind, this is a picture. Right? This is the picture in my mind of the world today for a person who has an intent. If you have intent, you can actually take all these resources, I call it all the inputs, from the cloud. Again, to use a buzzword, but essentially take them on demand. Whenever you need them, you can take these resources and just follow through to a goal. Beautiful, right? Well, <laughs> it is sounds simple, but of course, there's a reason why that line is dotted. There are, in any journey, there will be uh, hurdles, and uh, generally, because of periodic outages in any one of the inputs at a time, you will be not so uh, motivated to go towards your goal. That's happened in our journey as well. We are like very good at failing. Uh, we have failed, I joke around that more than 32 times we have failed with a prototype. We just sort of stumbled our way to success. Well, not even success right now, it's one more failure in the future. But anyway, so coming back to this, right, what, what I, I've heard people, you know, uh, mention uh, mentors who, who talk to me about uh, passion. I've heard people talk to me about uh, uh, perseverance, right? Both of these are some, somehow supposed to be the sort of missing ingredient, the glue which makes you stick together throughout this dotted line journey, that you won't, uh, you know, fall through the cracks, that you will somehow have the passion and the dedication and the perseverance to, you know, follow through. Um, that's true, actually, that those are important ones. In, but in my own sort of uh, opinion, it is one third, third one which we found very incredibly useful. And that, this is a much simpler concept, I'm going to talk about that today. It's actually play, the concept of play, to always have that childish delight that started, made you start doing something. I'll tell you, in fact, my own very simple example. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. Um, so uh, when, when I uh, you know, think back of what made me fall in love with technology about things, right? It's something like, oh, let, let me actually quote somebody much wiser than me. Arthur C. Clarke, uh, the, the science fiction writer, uh, many of you will know his, this quote of his, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Right? And that's how it is. And think of it. You are, I have in my hand a device. I click a button. Okay? I can convert a black screen into a light. Right? I can do it again, in fact, just for fun. Okay? Black screen, click, light. I have created light. Wow. Okay. Now, <laughs> this is, again, that's a delightful thing to realize, like, wow, this is stupendous. Okay? So that's, that's what got me started. And you can see me and my friend uh, Sumit. Um, starting out our journey in engineering. But, unfortunately, think back to the dotted line. Me and my friend Sumit had an intention, we had a strong intention. We were going to become the fabulous electrical engineers. We were going to build cool stuff, right? So this is our face when we hit our first textbook, right? So again, the first page on that was an equation. Um, we were not so good at math. I'm still not very good at math. I somehow stumbled through that as well. But this was a huge, huge downer for us, right? This is not fun. We wanted to build things and here we are, you know, mugging up formulae. And I guess all of you can sort of empathize with that. And this is what happened in like 30 minutes from the first lecture. All right? This is intention hitting the reality, right? Hitting the reality that it's not all hunky-dory and rosy and you won't get your goal in like five minutes. But play. Come back to play. What helped me and Sumit was framing our own vocabulary for these things, to keep alive that play. And I'll take the liberty of sort of sharing a slightly dorky poem with you. This is a poem about RLC parameters. Some of those of you, who, for those of you who are not electrical engineers, RLC parameters are actually just uh, building blocks of any circuit. The resistors, inductors, capacitors. They are there in that tube light, they are there in this uh, uh, clicker, they are there in every single uh, electrical or electronic device in this room. If you know them, you know a bunch of stuff you can do. So, uh, unfortunately, in that book, every resistor had like a ton of equations behind it, you know, you, you, you know all of them. Starting from damping to, well, you don't know all of them, but you have studied all of them. So you have, uh, you know, how, how an inductor is charged, is it an AC filter, is it a DC filter, what is the discharging curve, uh, what is the resonance, how does it happen, capacitor, the same thing with the capacitor, but then when these two come together, there's a bunch of stuff happening, and all of it is relating in like 100 equations which you can't memorize. That's the, that's the engineering textbook, right? So, related to the simplest, here's Sumit and my attempt. It's called uh, the voyage of the electrons, right? And why I call it the voyage of the electrons is, we thought very simply that, you know, when you have a, a circuit, uh, the electrons have to get right through. So, it's like a nice adventure for an electron how to go from one point to the other. So, here it is, right? 
an army of electrons march forth, building a movement south to north. There's an equation for that, remember, anybody? Eh? Since they are potential, lower to higher, and when they marched, there was power. They marched down the conduction band at the end of the wire, a foreign land. It was an insulator. Micah made, none shall pass, she said. Undeterred, they went another way. Marched they where low resistivity lay. We shall follow the path of least resistance, they said, and their word they have kept to this day. Our current carriers were generally upbeat, although some of them got dissipated as heat. Right across the resistor they went, right through a nitrome wire bent. There it is. And next came an obstacle unforeseen. It was an inductor with turns up teen. Thou shalt not change the current in me, said he, in any time less than infinity. Again, there's an equation for that, remember. What now, cried the electrons in panic, searching in vain for a passage quick. Since there could be no current change instantaneous, decided they wisely not to make a fuss. And the inductor, kind hearted, agreed to an exponential law in time t shall pass two out of every three, said he. Again, think back. And so marched on the army of electrons, out of the choke coil and into the aeons. And who should they next happen to meet but a capacitor and his pet dielectric? We've passed through resistors and we've passed by inductors, said they, and passed by also should we, uh, should we through this here capacitor. You might ask, how could they possibly? The electrons did it very simply, alternately. And all because of the capacitor and only a simple AC filter. Triumphant marched the army of electrons, for they had returned where they had started from. It really was a remarkable feat, you see, for the electric circuit was now complete. So there you have it. That's electrical engineering. Cool. So I'll just leave you with a very simple message. It's not prescriptive because I think all of you are much smarter than me in terms of what you intend. You have your own intentions. Intend very strongly. Believe in something. Something. And then do it, right? Have the play. Keep, keep, build your own vocabulary for everything around you and do stuff. There's nothing to lose. Thank you.